And thank you, Meta. Thank you uh, to uh, uh, for this uh, for uh, the, the seminar that uh, for organizing this seminar. You and your colleagues. And uh, yes, uh, I'm a Torontonian, uh, though I've I sort of I've left the the flock and I've. I uh, became a U.S. citizen, but U of T is my alma mater. I got my B.A. here uh, at Victoria, and uh, so it's really wonderful to be back uh, to my uh, hometown. Though I'm having trouble recognizing uh, parts of it, <laughs> so I need to spend more time here. Um, so um, I want to just start off by asking you all a question, which is, um, how many people uh, feel that uh, corruption is a problem in their country, whether it be Canada or wherever they're from? Okay, yeah. So I, the majority feels that corruption is a problem. How many people feel that it's linked to other problems, other problems and injustices in their country? Okay, so. We have unity. That's one of the first things we're going to talk about. We have unity on this topic that we need, that this is something that's of concern to people. Um, so what we will do in this session is, it, I've been given a, a challenge, which is to talk about unity planning and nonviolent discipline, which are three important um, elements that one can find in successful nonviolent campaigns and movements. And uh, Macha Bartkowski started uh, giving, uh, uh, providing the segue about this topic. But, I, but I'm going to do it in the context of anti-corruption. But there are so many other things that one would want to discuss. So it's going to be like a combination of integrating the two. Uh, so starting off, you'll see two photos. The one on the left is from Kenya, Mombasa. And it's, uh, these are uh, what are called social audits. You could call them nonviolent campaigns. And uh, they are definitely uh, wielding power. Uh, so they are, uh, it is a uh, form of civil resistance. And on the right, you can see something called the textbook walk uh, campaign, which took place in the Philippines for three years um, back around 2003, in which one million Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, hundreds of thousands of parents, uh, the public services union, all kinds of uh, community groups were involved to combat corruption in uh, elementary schools around textbooks. And so you will see actually the children um, bringing textbooks to their schools in which they would then count them to make sure that they had the number of textbooks to which they were entitled in their school. Uh, so two very different campaigns, two different kinds of civil resistance and very different from the types of movements and campaigns that we heard about in the first session which really shows that civil resistance is um, a phenomenon that occurs uh, in many, many different manifestations for many, many different kinds of injustices and oppression. So um, just to give you a sense, just over the past uh, year and a half, there are, have been campaigns related to corruption in all of these countries. Uh, Dr. Bartkowski talked about some of them already, but I'm going to show you a clip uh, from one next door. I'm going to show you two minutes of the clip because it really uh, it gets to the heart of uh, our focus on unity, planning, and nonviolent discipline.
I wish I could show you the whole thing, but I think you get the gist of it. The messages that are coming out of this are unity, planning, tactical creativity, clear demands, um, a, uh, you could say, uh, taking tactics and sequencing them. All of this goes back to this, this conversation now about unity planning and nonviolent discipline. And as you can see, anti-corruption struggles are linked to other things in society, in this case, um, preserving uh, democracy, uh, looking at structural oppression like inequality, and um, corruption. So in a way, it encapsulates everything, and it's occurring in a democracy. So just very quickly, I'd like to just define corruption, because I think we all know what we, we are thinking about uh, in terms of corruption. But I want to offer you um, three de uh, definitions. The first one is the traditional definition, uh, misuse of entrusted power for private gain. But it's not enough to really get to the heart of how we want to fight corruption and impact it. Not just fight it, but impact it. So the second um, definition is one that I developed. And that is to look at corruption as a system. Uh, corruption doesn't function in, uh, at, at, you know, at, in random acts between a corrupter and a corruptee. Um, it is a system where you have abuse of power. And it's not just for private gain. It's for collective gain, for, some, for groups, uh, or political gain, for political power. And it often involves very complex sets of relationships, most of which we, we cannot see. Uh, that's why we always think about we want uh, transparency, because most corruption happens below the surface where we can't see it. And all of these relationships have vested interests to perpetuate whatever is the corruption that is going on, because they're getting benefits from it, either personal benefits, collective benefits for a group, or political benefits. So all these vested interests are going to try to thwart whatever people do to fight corruption, whether these are people in society or whether these are people within a government or within a corporation or within any other entity that is honestly trying to fight corruption. They will want to thwart it. So we need to think about corruption as something that we want to disrupt, which goes back to civil resistance, which Dr. Barkowski was talking about. In the short run, we need to think about disrupting the system. In the long run, we may want to think about transforming and uh, getting rid of that corrupt system. But in the short run, it's disruption. Because we cannot tackle everything at once. As Dr. Barkowski said, corruption is something nebulous and abstract. So we need to sort of narrow it down, break it down into things that we can grasp and focus on. The third definition is a people-centric definition. It's a bottom-up definition about corruption, which is, what is corruption for a person? Corruption for a person is how that person is affected by corruption, oppressed by it, denied things. So it can be the denial of a right that they have, uh, a right to education, a right to, uh, um, to justice, um, a right to uh, procedures, uh, for example, police procedures, not being thrown in jail and then being forced to pay a bribe. Um, it can be an entitlement that they're entitled to. For example, a pension, a tax refund. Uh, it can be a wage that they're entitled to. It can be medicine. It can be all of these things uh, that they're entitled to. So for the average person, corruption can be then a denial of their rights and an experience of aggression, in, I mean, of oppression in their daily lives. So, I mean, uh, if, we, if we think of normally how we have traditionally tried to impact corruption, it has been through technocratic and legislative measures. And I'm not going to get into those now, but just to, to sort of give some background for um, what anti-corruption campaigns and movements do. And so, when we just focus on these top-down measures, we forget about this whole other realm, which is people power civil resistance and the role that it can play to impact corruption. And what happens with technocratic and legislative measures, if they're just, if that's the sole focus, is that the systemic nature of corruption can be missed, the fact that corruption functions in systems. 
and that there is also a limited focus on other sectors beyond the state because corruption doesn't just involve the state or a government. It involves other sectors in society. It can be private sector. It can be religious institutions. It can even be civil society. It can even be unions. It can be all different kinds of sectors in a given society. So we need to think about corruption more holistically if we want to fight it. And why do we want to fight it? It's because of the harm that it causes to people and to societies. And so there's this assumption, which is, has traditionally been an assumption in, anti, in the anti-corruption world, that once you put these top-down measures in place, then things will change. But unfortunately, in reality, that's not what always happens. And that goes back to our definition of corruption, in that people have vested interests to perpetuate the system. How can we expect those who are benefiting from corruption and the institutions uh, that are benefiting from corruption to be the ones that will willingly, genuinely want to curb it. You may have individuals who want to curb it in there, but they're outnumbered. We need the power of numbers, which is what comes from civil resistance. So we need to think about then, how then do we change that system and not just assume that it will change on its own just because we have top-down measures. And I love this quote from Loris Lessing. I won't read it out, um, but I think it applies to a lot of institutions. Uh, I will reflect on the ones in the US, not any others, but I think we can sort of relate to that no matter where we come from. Um, so I um, had the good fortune to have a dream come true, which was to do research for really too many years um, and then write a book which also took too long to do, but in the end, I did it. And this is the result, and I think you got a reading from it and a reference to it. And I documented 16 cases around the world of nonviolent campaigns and movements that were targeting corruption. And I put 12 into the book, because uh, I had a page limit. And uh, so I couldn't fit all 16 in there. Um, but you can buy, you can find the book, and I hope that actually the U of T library has it. Um, and so, these were the countries uh, in which I researched, and I didn't l go to these countries and just like pick these countries. This is where I found a lot of cases. I mean, this is where I found the cases. And since I finished wrapping up the research, I've been finding so many more cases, and I've just started, for example, I've, I've been in contact, and I've started to get information about a movement in Romania uh, called uh, Save Rosia Montana. Some of you are nodding your heads, which was actually because there's a Canadian connection. Um, so you may know about it that way. Um, this was a movement to stop a Canadian company from actually uh, uh, implementing an open pit gold mining uh, project in uh, the last, you could say, preserved uh, natural forest in all of Europe, uh, called the Rosia Montana. And, um, they just succeeded. Uh, there was massive corruption. So this was, for the people involved, a campaign about uh, environment, protecting their way of life, and corruption. And they just, uh, Parliament passed a, uh, some sort of a legislation to now stop this project. The company, the Canadian company, is now, uh, has gone to arbitration. Uh, it wants, it's threatening the Romanian government to sue them for losses in the billions of dollars. Uh, so we will see where it goes, um, but uh, so far this has been a massive victory. So you see here three photos. One, uh, the top, uh, the top uh, right is from India, the fifth pillar. Fifth pillar for in uh, this was a movement about bribery. It's also a movement to transform India, but in the short run it's to empower regular citizens to say no to paying bribes uh, because this... Uh, denies them so many things that they need, especially poor and marginalized people. Um, so they say that in any society, there are more, in any healthy society, in a healthy democracy, there are more than four pillars. The fifth pillar is the citizenry. And for a healthy democracy, you need an active uh, citizenry. The bottom left is from uh, Ficha Limpa, Brazil. This was a, a movement uh, that uh, developed and uh, through a, a I don't want to get into the details, but successfully through a mass uh, nonviolent movement, 
uh, submitted legislation into the, into the Brazilian Congress to prevent uh, people from holding office if they were convicted by more than one judge of particular serious crimes, including corruption. And the, on the right, you have the Integrity Watch Afghanistan Community Monitoring Initiatives, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them later because I suspect not, not too many people have heard about them and they're quite extraordinary. So what does it look like when people actually are trying to impact corruption? Um, you see again a photo from the textbook walk and textbook campaign. You see students with all the boxes. They're opening all the boxes and counting them. It's not easy to, to fight corruption in the Philippines. People get killed, people get disappeared. So uh, even in a democracy, uh, things are not easy. So I don't want to like present this as something really easy. Uh, this was an extraordinary campaign uh, over several years. On the bottom left, a middle left, you see a glass. Dr. Barkowski talked about everyday acts of resistance. What happens if your act of resistance is holding a glass and drinking from it? If I'm doing it, maybe not too much. But what if 150,000 people have glasses with that logo, which says Shayfin Kom, which in Arabic means we're watching you. <laughs> and these glasses were distributed to tea houses all over the country. And so these glasses are used every day by people who go and get and buy a cup of tea in a little tea house. That it becomes an everyday act of resistance. And what will the authorities do? This took place during the Mubarak regime. This was a, a campaign called Shefinkom, We're Watching You, founded by three women and, uh, all, and then thousands of volunteers, including a lot of youth. Um, they developed what could be called a dilemma action. It was on the one hand an everyday act of resistance, but on the other hand it was a dilemma action. What would the police do or authorities do? Go around and arrest? thousands of people every day drinking tea. They also had shopping bags, the reusable shopping bags that they gave out to women. And women were walking around with their shopping bags. What would the police do? Arrest women with their, with their groceries in the shopping bags? So this was a very clever, low risk, mass action, dilemma action, everyday act of resistance tactic. Um, so I want to show you another tactic because this uh, will be, this is about Afghanistan. Monitoring. Who would have thought that monitoring can be a not, an act of nonviolent resistance? Well, I'll just give you a glimpse of what that looks like. And just watch what the people are saying in, in this video clip, because it goes back to what we're talking about, unity and planning. این سرک نوین است در این پروژه به شکل مثال می توان دریافت که مردم به چه اندازه خود را در قبال نظارت از شیوه مصرف کمک ها مسئول می دانند این سرک به طول 13.3 کیلومتر و عرض 4 متر به یک شرکت ساختمانی به قرار داد داده شده است ولی بیشتر قسمت های سرک کم تر از 3 متر کار شده است دو متر دو متر شست دو افتاد این جمشه دو افتاد این جمشه دو افتاد این نظر انجینیر شرکت تطبیق کننده را نیز داشته باشیم دو لایه باید چار متر باشه شما لایه اول سوالی هم بجر برو متر تپر تا که دو لایه خلاص شده با چار متر جایی که جایی که با همی پول خونه مانه این پول ملات ای چری نداره میسه ما این دو در بچه ما از حق خود دفاع میکنیم بگه نگه ما از حق خود که ما میکنیم که ما میتونیم تو خیانتی بخذاره بره همین اینجنر شاهد گفت یک قسمت سرکی که ساعت فی سرک و تکمیل شده همین سرکه خب ببینین تا یک قسمت سرک خلاص شده دو لای رخته شده یک لا چارده میلیه که پیشتر می گفت یک لای چارده میلی رخته میشه یک لا ده میلی روی رخته میشه که تکمیل شده 
این قسمت تا کجا بگیره و اگه تا اینجا هم که ما بگیریم بیخی تا اینجا گاه امی که امی که نیه کوکی آخه این دیگه سمت اینجا خود نایی دیگه شعبه دوزی هم نیه دو و شهد سرک اینجا گاه سمت را اگه قرار بود چهار متر کار بشه خب باید سرک تا اینجا کار بشه خود از اگه اینا میبینه کلا نه زیرسازی نه غیره این چیزی در اصلا نیه چهار متر This is what we could call nonviolent resistance uh, to corruption. These are community monitoring projects of reconstruction and development projects in Afghanistan. And I'll tell you more about them in a minute. Um, I'm going to show you one more clip and then move on. This comes from uh, Kenya, from Mombasa, from Muslims for Human Rights. And um, this is part of their five-step social audit. You saw the picture of the so of one of the scenes from a social audit on at the very beginning so it, this is step five out of six in which there's a public forum and the relevant officials are invited uh, and it's uh, the community presents its mo its auditing findings of projects that are supposed to be developed uh, implemented in the in the community to um, alleviate poverty and, mo and marginalization zilizofanywa hivi siku zilizopita zilifanywa na wakazi wa hapa hapa likoni Mimi na wewe moja kwa moja tuna jukumu kuhakikisha kwamba pesa zile zimetunufaisha vile inavyostahili ndio tumeweza kupata fursa ya kuweza kukagua ile miradi ambayo imetekelezwa na kusimamiwa na kamati za CDF ambazo tupo nazo hapa leo Nitapenda kuhakikishia kitu kimoja kwamba nia zetu si za kisiasa tumekuja hapa ili tupiane maarifa la kwanza la pili tupate kujua mambo ambayo yanatendeka katika nchi hii mambo kuhusu ufisadi kwa majina naitwa Mope Halfani ni mkazi wa likoni nazaliwa hapa hapa Bofuot Narudi sasa kuleta ripoti za mradi wa Majisa Primary School. Tukapata kuwa kandarasi ama zile contractor hakuwa anatenda notice. Kandarasi za zabuni hazikutangazwa. Hali ya mradi ilikuwa umemalizika lakini hakukuwa na ile certificate of completion. Yaani sitakabadi inaonyesha kuwa ile mradi umemalizika. Nataka kuzungumzia mradi wa Mtongwe Primary School. Ukarabati wa madarasa saba ulikuwa umetengewa kiwango cha shilingi milioni moja na laki moja na zikatumika shilingi laki tisa mianari na sabina ni alfu baadhi ya vitu ambavyo vilikuwa vinakosekana katika stakabadhi ambazo ni muhimu wakati wakupeana tenders kwa sababu tumekuja kuelezwa pesa zetu zimefanya kazi na mna gani tunajua bei ya mawe tunajua bei ya leba tunataka hiyo yote isemwe ili kujue pesa tumetumika na mna gani tuendelee na tusema nakuja kuzungumzia masuala ya basari kama uwe na uhusiano kama mjukuu wake rafiki ya babako kitu namna hiyo tuko na watu walotoa ushuhuda kwa ampewa hizo basari sasa tujiulizeni tuelekea wapi sisi walikuwa ni tuelekea wapi aswa hii basari tutaipata kweli ikiwa tuna uhusiano karibu na so they're very different uh, interesting tactics so if when we start studying anti corruption campaigns and movements we see that actually this this uh, tactical creativity of different kinds of movements really expands the the repertoire of nonviolent uh, tactics Um, so I want to show, I'm not going to show you any more um, uh, clips, but just focus on this photo. You see this photo at the top? It looks like a meeting, right? This comes from Afghanistan. This is called the Provincial Monitoring Board Meeting. It was created by Integrity Watch Afghanistan, which is a civil society organization and is part of the community monitoring initiatives there. So that just looks pretty mundane, but what if we realize that sitting around that table are the local volunteers from a community monitoring effort 
together with relevant officials, together with the contracting company in charge of, or subcontracting company, perhaps a donor uh, representative, in charge of the reconstruction and development project. What if we think that probably those local volunteers don't have a lot of education, they come from marginalized communities, and that up until they were involved in this effort, nobody really paid any attention to them and treated them with contempt. As you, as you remember from the clip where um, one of the officials uh, at, the, at the road said, don't interfere, it's not your business. So this meeting is actually a revolution. This is a revolution of power relations in this local area in Afghanistan, where people who are marginalized are sitting at the table with people who have official power, and they are providing them information and that the local media has been invited there and is, is actually reporting on this meeting. So something that looks like a meeting can be a revolution. And this is also another kind of nonviolent tactic. And at the bottom you see one from um, Italy. This is from Palermo, the Adio Pizzo movement. This was a nonviolent youth resistance uh, movement. It's still going on against the uh, Cosa Nostra mafia in Palermo. And this is a store that sells mafia-free products. <laughs> and they innovated something very clever. They innovated the reverse boycott. So that is a, not where you boycott a, um, a businesses or uh, products. You support businesses and products. In this case, businesses and products that are mafia-free and that have been verified by the movement and a sister organization of what they call the oldies called uh, Free Future, Libero Futuro. Um, and that's the older generation. So there you have something revolutionary, another act of everyday resistance, uh, which is buying something, consuming something, patronizing something. In this case, though, you are supporting mafia-free uh, enterprises. So three attributes of effective nonviolent movements and campaigns are unity, planning, and nonviolent discipline, which Dr. Bartkowski started talking about. So the first one is unity. Um, unity involves unity of people. It can be people, men and women. It can be um, different uh, sectors. I mean, it can be from different parts of the country. It can be different ethnic groups. It can be uh, people who are um, marginalized people who are poor or people who are working class, middle class, upper class. It can be lots of things, but it's unity of people. So in Afghanistan, on the left, that's a good unity photo. That's why I put it there. But that's the unity of a community. Of course, there were, sort of, there were women too, but I, admittedly, they were not, it's not so easy to photograph them uh, in this context. Um, so there, it was the unity of the whole community. It was not the unity of the nation. But in that struggle context, it was the community that was struggling. So it was the unity of the community. On the left, you see, if, I mean, on the right, a photo from uh, Korea, the Citizens Alliance for the General Election 2000 campaign. That was the unity of a nation. That was a national movement about political corruption and basically the fact that after 30 years of dictatorship and then a nonviolent movement uprising, Korea actually won a democracy, but then people started saying, our democracy sucks. Um, we have lousy choices. All these candidates are lousy. They're just thinking about themselves. Is this what we struggled for for so many years? We want candidates who are worthy of representing us. And so the campaign was a blacklisting campaign uh, around which many different nonviolent tactics occurred to mobilize citizens to uh, pledge and refuse to vote for people who were uh, evaluated in a transparent manner as being unfit to represent the people. And why do we need un uh, unity? Because it goes back to what uh, Dr. Barkowski was talking about. It's the power of numbers. People power, nonviolent resistance comes from participation of many people. And it's through unity. One, one method, one way is through unity that we get that power of numbers. There's also unity of goals. If everybody has different goals, how are we going to have a nonviolent movement? And in fact, sometimes we can look at nonviolent movements, perhaps that were not effective, 
and, and look and see, did they have a unity of goals? Were there too many, were people too spread over too many different things and they couldn't figure out what they wanted? And so they couldn't generate enough support because of that, enough people to, to join their movement. Um, and it also involves something, and I learned this from my research, shared outrage or, and or shared grievances. It's not enough to have unity of people and goals. There has to be something that's shared, either outrage about some injustice or oppression, or grievances that people have in common. So for example, in anti-corruption campaigns, this taps grievances that people have. It may be corruption itself, or it may be things that you were thinking about when you raised your hand and I asked you, is corruption related to other grievances in your society? So often in anti-corruption campaigns and movements, they're not even using the word corruption per se. They are fighting, for, they are addressing a grievance. As we saw in Kenya, the grievance was that these funds, these constituency development funds are not being spent properly to benefit us poor communities in the slums of Mombasa. And what they discovered was that corruption was the impediment to dealing with this pro with this. Uh, grievance. There's also a fourth element of, uh, of, uni of unity, and that's a commonly perceived source of injustice and oppression. So in the first session, you heard a lot about movements against occupations and dictatorships. There you can have a very clear target, a very clear source of oppression. In other types of movements, you may not necessarily have something very clear. In fact, when you're addressing, with, addressing something that's systemic, like corruption or discrimination against a group, a minority group uh, in society, or, or gender discrimination, or, or gen, I mean, gender inequality, all of these things, there's not necessarily a target that's very clear, but you can identify, you can figure out some perceived sources of injustice. So in, um, in, for example, Brazil and Mexico and Korea, that was the political establishment. <coughs> That's still wide, but then that was narrowed down to the parliament or political parties. So there was a source of oppression. In Uganda, there was a campaign against uh, police corruption at, on the ground, not high level police corruption, but everyday police corruption where people are just um, you know, pulled over and harassed and intimidated and extorted. Um, in India, it's the public sector. Again, that's not a, a target like a dictator, but, is a, but it is perceived as a source of injustice. Um, in Italy, it was the mafia. Again, the mafia is not one person. You never know exactly who's in the mafia. You may know like a few, like, you know, heads, uh, godfathers, you may hear about them, but you don't know everybody in the mafia. But you sort of have a sense that that's your source of your oppression. In Egypt, it became clear. In Egypt, it was the overall government, and then ultimately Mubarak. And there are also, if you want to think about unity, and I'm going to tie in something that Dr. Bartkowski talked about, there are three collectives that I found from my research that I think are pertinent. Um, this sense of collective responsibility. So you could say these three collectives are psychological underpinnings of unity. So I was a psych major here at the University of Toronto, so maybe you see a little bit of that influence coming out here. That in unity, you have a sense, to build unity, you have a sense of collective responsibility. It's not just like I'm responsible, or they are responsible, whoever they are, the authorities, the government, um, whatever. It's that we have a responsibility to deal with this oppression and injustice. And then it's this sense of ownership. Who owns this effort? It's us, all of us that own this effort. It's not somebody that we're doing it for. We're not, it's different from an NGO that gets money, for example, whether it's from the state or an external donor or whatever, and they're implementing a project. There's, that, there's not collective ownership in that. There's collective ownership when people are doing this together and they're volunteering for, the, for like the majority of them are volunteering and they're putting in their time and efforts and sometimes money and, and other resources. 
So there's that sense of it's ours. We own it. If we, if there's success, it's because of us. We brought the success, the change. And then there's this notion of collective identity, which Dr. Bartkowski also mentioned. And this was developed by a sociologist named Lee Smithy. Some of you who are uh, in sociology may be familiar with his writings. And it is what he calls a sense of we-ness. We. So it's not me and you and him and her, or it's we becomes a unit. We are one. And that notion of collective identity is something really important in unity, building unity. So how about planning? Well, planning is really important uh, because if movements and campaigns are not well planned, um, a lot of things can go awry. Even if they are well planned, things will go awry. So it's really important to have to have to plan, to organize, to strategize. And that involves organization. How are you organized as a, as a campaign or movement? Is it just a random bunch of people who say, yeah, we want to like, we, we want to like uh, deal with this problem, this oppression, this grievance? Is there some sort of organization? There's no one particular magical formula for organization. And different movements and campaigns develop what works for them. But there's always some organization, even if, if things are very um, horizontal in terms of hierarchy, even if there's not a lot of hierarchy, there's always organization. Um, information gathering and listening is very important. Um, you can't do something unless you have inf gathered your information about whatever it is you want to address. Who are your potential allies? Who are, the, who are those that are going to be um, the most apt to block what you're doing? Who, are, who is involved in the, whatever you're trying to address um, in, in, in that, that source, of, um, source of injustice? Who's involved in it? Institutions, people. And it also involves listening. Who, who thinks that they know the answers for everyone? We may be a, a group of concerned citizens wanting to address something, but what makes us the keepers of all knowledge? Listening is part of planning. Listening to what others have to say. Listening to what people on the ground are experiencing. Listening to their ideas, to their suggestions. Interestingly, in my research, I found that it came up over and over again that people that I was talking to, these were people who were leaders and strategizers in these efforts, were saying, we went on and we talked with people. Or people came to us and talked to us. And that's how they started getting, how they got going. That's fueled their creativity, their capacity to build unity. Strategizing is really important. In all of these campaigns, what was interesting also is that they may not have said, we are developing a strategic plan. But they did it anyway. They had an idea of where they are, where they wanted to go, and what they needed to do to get to where they wanted to go to achieve their objectives. Um, tactical development and sequencing was very important in these campaigns. So you saw, for example, from Kenya, they, had, they developed a six-stage social audit. In, I'm going to show you the chart from, um, from Iowa and Afghanistan so you see how complex was everything that they developed. Um, communications it goes into planning. What are our messages? Who are we going to target with our messages? And um, then co coordination. How are we going to be coordinated in what we're doing? It's not random. We need to have some sort of a system in place to be coordinated, especially if we want to build unity. For example, if we are working together with many groups, like in an alliance in Korea, the Citizens Alliance had about 1,084 civic groups involved. That required a lot of coordination. They developed a brilliant plan uh, in order to facilitate that cooperate coordination. And then this third element that's really important for effective nonviolent campaigns and movements is nonviolent discipline. And Dr. Barkowski talked about it, uh, started talking about it in the beginning. But nonviolent uh, movements derive their capacity to involve people because of their nonviolent nature. 
they derive their capacity to wield pressure through their nonviolent tactics. They derive their capacity to generate backfire if there's repression because they are nonviolent in their actions and their character. Uh, so nonviolent discipline is essential. We can't assume that we will that everybody will just be nonviolent because there are always people who, especially in, in the heat of the moment, may be provoked or may, be, or may not be able to control themselves, or there may be agents provocateurs sent to instigate violence, to discredit the movement or campaign. So nonviolent dis discipline is essential. And so I wanted to share with you what I learned from in the context of anti-corruption campaigns and movements, that interestingly, many of these campaigns and movements assessed the need for nonviolent discipline. And I don't think that they like sat down and said, OK, um, tomorrow at 12 noon, we're going to sit down and assess the need for nonviolent discipline. They, but they did it implicitly in what they did. Um, so um, in Afghanistan, this need to stay nonviolent was included in the local monitor trainings. So there you had each community elected two local monitors who then were the monitors for the project, the life of the project, which was usually a, one year. Integrity Watch Afghanistan, Iowa, conducted trainings to empower these local monitors to actually um, carry out the weekly monitoring of the project. Part of their trainings was on the need to stay nonviolent. Um, in Kenya, Muhuri, Muslims for Human Rights, they too, uh, emphasized nonviolent discipline in their trainings. They didn't say, okay, um, local citizens, uh, in your training, you're going to learn all about nonviolent discipline. But they emphasized that their, the whole character of what they were doing was nonviolent and they needed to stay nonviolent. Um, in Korea, they also anticipated um, the potential that violence might erupt, especially harassment from political candidates that were on the blacklist. So they developed what they called a peace charter and a nonviolence manual. And so um, I, there, the quote is from Taeho Ho Lee, one of the um, leaders of that um, campaign in, in South Korea. And um, basically, they sa he said, we, we just felt it was not, um, that violence was not necessary and that it was not helpful to our campaign. And so then they, they worked from that. And then for many campaigns, at least in anti-corruption realms, violence was, was totally out of the realm of consideration that they would engage in violence. And that's very interesting. That it was like something beyond like, you know, what do you mean what, that you know, we would use violence? Because I, I, I interviewed people. It was like, it's like completely irrelevant to what we're doing. They're, I mean, we would, we would never even consider using violence. So that was also an interesting dimension that for some struggles, they, it was never even an assessment that they would use violence. But then, on the other hand, if there was a sense that there could be a provocation of violence, they needed to have discipline not to react violently. So I just want to summarize, give you a sense of um, what they did in Korea as an example. So they took proactive steps, which I just mentioned. Uh, the peace charter. They had press conferences affirming the nonviolent nature of their campaign so that this became public, uh, their identity as a campaign was linked to nonviolence. And thirdly, their nonviolence manual. So I've got like an excerpt that they, they, they explained to me in English. And I just like it because uh, it's very practical. Um, you know, in the most serious cases, run away. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, this is how you maintain nonviolent discipline. If people are harassing you, let them take your stuff. Let them throw it. Let them rip up your campaign materials, your, peti your petitions. Don't react. And then run away if it escalates. So I'm just going to like do as a case study Afghanistan. It'll take three, four minutes, and then we'll just have, again, uh, we'll pick up on the discussion. So this was, in Afghanistan, the, there was a grievance that regular people had no say in reconstruction and development in their communities. And the projects that were done were shoddy. 
And what does that mean in terms of shoddy? You saw the road was not built according to standards. In another case, there was a school in an earthquake zone. A new uh, wing to a high school was built in an earthquake zone where there had been an earthquake just three years earlier. And substandard concrete was used, for example. The wiring was exposed. So the next time there was an earthquake, if that, if that building was full of children, you can imagine what would happen. So these were the grievances. Um, what were the objectives? They never said we're fighting corruption, but that's what, they were, that's what they were tackling. But they said, we want to make aid and service provision accountable to citizens and empower communities to have a voice, a say over reconstruction, and bring the key parties together, the key parties involved, government, international actors, and locals. Those were their objectives. So in a way, now we're starting with their, their, organ, their plan, their planning. Unity, they, unity they built from the bottom up. So how did they do it? Iowa would go to local communities and talk to them, sit with them, drink tea with them. And if a local community wanted to engage in a community monitoring project, Iowa would support them, give them the skills, training, and information they needed that they couldn't get up by themselves. Unity was built by the fact that um, uh, community leaders went around the community and asked people, uh, did a survey to ask them what, what project they wanted to monitor. So nobody told them what to monitor. This was chosen by the community through a survey. Now that survey is a nonviolent tactic in of itself. And that survey is building unity in of itself. Planning, you saw the planning, you saw this. This is like one of the most sophisticated things I've ever seen in terms of like a, a campaign. It's brilliant. It's very complex. Nonviolent discipline. Um, they emphasize that in their training for the local monitors. So for example, that interaction that you saw in the clip where um, they're talking to the responsible officials about the road and the guy's like, don't interfere. And the monitor, you know, he got, a little, he got a little sort of upset, but there was no fight that broke out or anything like that. They, there was, I, as far as I know, there was never once any sort of uh, violent interaction in these efforts. I could be wrong, maybe there was one or two and I don't know about it, but as far as I know, none. And I think this, this quote is very important from Lorenzo de las Guez, uh, who was one of the co-founders. And he said, coming out of a post-conflict context where violence was so prevalent, people knew its consequences, and they are more reluctant to engage in violence. I was shocked when he told me that. I thought he was going to say, well, you know, we've had this violent conflict for so many years, and before that we had another violent conflict in, with the Russians and invasion and everything. And, and, um, and so, you know, people, are, you know, we, you know, people were you know, very prone to violence, so we had to do it. And he said the opposite to me. People knew how bad violence was, how destructive it was. So they would be hesitant. However, he said, though, and this was really interesting, he said, but if you want to be nonviolent in a violent environment, you have to be effective. People need to see something come out of what they're doing. Otherwise, it could, there could be um, a chance to, uh, that there could be some violence erupting. So these are different tactics that they used. I won't read them out. You can just take a look. You see the term here, defining method? A defining method is another term that we use in civil resistance. It was developed by sociologist Kurt Schock. And a defining method is a tactic around which many other nonviolent tactics revolve. So you could say in Afghanistan, it was the monitoring, which you saw in the clip, that they were measuring that road. Or in Kenya, it would be going and inspecting a project. Uh, a school or a clinic, or in some cases they, they went to inspect the school and it wasn't there. It existed on the books, but it didn't exist in reality. Um, and uh, so that's the defining method. But around that, there are so many different tactics that, uh, that uh, take place, and they're sequenced. And that goes back to the organization and planning. And these are the outcomes, which are pretty interesting. Um, they say that they have what they call a two-thirds success rate. Um, because they said, in general, in Afghanistan, these, there was so much corruption in these uh, projects overall that they were not only trying to find corruption and rectify it, they wanted to prevent corruption. 
So in the cases where there were no problems, they considered that a victory because they said the likelihood of corruption would have been high. So they feel that they, they played a role in preventing the corruption. And just so you know, again, this goes back to this external actors, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. They had support from NORAD, which is a Norwegian development agency. Uh, they had some flexible funding, which um, allowed them that they, were allow they could take from that funding that they had $30,000 for a pilot program with 10 villages. And then they had support from an NGO, an international NGO, that, uh, Thierry. So can you imagine $30,000 to launch a project with 10 villages? Goes back to this whole issue about money. It's peanuts. Absolutely peanuts when you think about it. Because these things are driven by people. Nobody's paid to do this. The villagers aren't paid. And in fact, in Afghanistan, there were some, <laughs> um, some people, I won't like, try to like, point fingers, that said, oh, this is great. Let's have the companies um, involved in the projects um, get local monitors. So you had contracting companies paying villagers to monitor their own projects. And that was the inspiration they took from IWAS, monitoring projects. That, and that's like, it gets back to what you're saying. That is like the, like the absolute wrong thing to learn from this. And if, in fact, when they started paying them, you can imagine what happened. There were problems, money was stolen. In one case, somebody took them, um, stole money and like in the village and used it to build a house. You can, no unity, no nothing, just um, problems. Um, so I will stop there and we have uh, time to continue our conversation. Uh, questions, comments?